Welcome to City Church. Thank you for joining us in worship. We want to appreciate the worship team. We call that in tune. We also want to come and recognize it's the last Sunday of marvelous May. Lots of miracles happened. It's a magnificent month, and we're coming into a new month, and we'll see you on that in the coming Sunday. End this month strong, okay? And we appreciate all of you that have logged online, you're streaming with us. Please subscribe as well to our YouTube channel. There's a lot of people that have already joined, and it's practically simultaneous with the Facebook live stream that you're on today. And so we want to welcome everybody, okay? There's also midweek services that we have throughout the week, and as you follow that, we appreciate you. We want to appreciate all the volunteers that make this happen, as well as everybody that's giving. It's been fantastic, a fantastic giving month. And for many that were blessed, they love to give, and people that are blessed love to give. So we want to welcome you today. Sit back, make sure you have your Bible ready, and as we come, open your hearts to be able to hear the Word, okay? Last week, we talked to you about why prayers don't get answered. Just a quick review. We said, well, number one, it's not God's will. When it's not God's will, no matter how much you pray, nothing's going to happen. Then we said, you know, it's our motives are wrong. When you have wrong motives, thirdly, we said, when you're not ready to receive what you're praying for. And fourthly, we said, unbelief. Unbelief will make sure your prayers don't get answered. And fifthly, demonic delay. We brought some scriptures out for that. And then lastly, our hearts are not right before the Lord. Of course, the very opposite can happen with that. Your prayers do get answered when it is God's will, when your motives are, are right, when you're mature enough to receive, when you add faith to it, and then when there's angelic assistance, as well as a pure heart in attitude. So today we're coming to Matthew chapter 8. I want you to turn your Bibles to there. And Father, we thank you that your word is life and spirit. We thank you there's anointing and power in your word, and there's a life-changing power upon the word when our hearts are open, the anointing of the Spirit of God upon those who listen with a good heart. Bless your word to the, every listener in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. And this is a story when Jesus heals a centurion servant. I'm reading from verse 5. Now, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed dreadfully tormented. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, he said, and um, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one of my soldiers and to me, Go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that very same hour in Jesus' name. We are talking about the healing of the centurion's servant today. And we'd like to entitle this, because you and I want our prayers answered, that God is a God of order. By the time you leave today, we're going to go through this story, uh, through the verses, and we'll pick out from this story the ingredients that are necessary for your miracle to happen, for prayers to get answered. Jesus heals a centurion's servant. Now, 
in the situation this world is in with the pandemic, there's a lot of prayer for protection and for healing. And when it comes to healing, in your scriptures, in the Bible, you will see that Jesus healed many ways. He healed people by touching them. He healed people when he spoke a prayer to them. He healed a particular person by making ointment with his own saliva and soil, placing it on a man's eyes, and the blind man was told to wash it, and when he washed, his sight was restored. Notice that Jesus heals. Some people don't believe Jesus heals today. We're here to tell you Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He still heals. And the manner of healing is determined by him. Recognize this, that we don't decide how we will get healed. We just add our faith and say, Lord, we believe that by your stripes we are healed, that we shall rise with healing in your wings, that the prayer made in faith uh, shall heal the sick. These are all scriptural promises. Jesus heals, but the manner by which he heals is up to him. We don't tell Jesus, Lord, I just want to be healed. You know, everybody wants a miracle, but I don't want surgery. I don't want medicine. Uh, but Jesus will heal through surgery. He will heal through medicine. He'll heal through doctors. He'll heal through prayer, etc. There are many ways that Jesus will heal. But in this story, I want you to see that there was a part where in the man comes to Jesus. The centurion comes to Jesus begging him because his servant is sick. And Jesus says, I'll go to him. And the centurion says, no, you, you shouldn't come because it's, my house is not worthy to receive you. I'm not worthy to have you in my house. Jesus marveled at that. Jesus was amazed. And that's why we're pulling this story out because when was the last time you saw Jesus was amazed? Now, we get amazed by Jesus, but in this story, Jesus is the one who gets amazed. And the centurion gets healed. Jesus says, go your way. And as he went, the Bible said, his servant was healed. And recognize this, this was long distance healing. This was healing where Jesus was not even there. This was proxy healing. This was somebody coming in intercession and saying, Jesus, my servant who's not here is sick. And the healing bypassed through the servant, to he to, through the centurion to the servant. And so online healing is even possible right now as you add your faith. Healing by live stream is possible. So our question today is, what are the ingredients to this miracle as we talk about God is a God of order? Okay, listen carefully. Before this story starts, here's the setting. Israel was occupied by the Roman Empire. They were now a minuscule province of the empire of Rome, a centurion who is an officer of a hundred men, has a servant who's paralyzed and suffering. In the gospel of Luke, it was described as the servant was at the point of death, desperation. When an urgency becomes an emergency, this centurion now approaches Jesus. How many of you know desperate people will try anything? The centurion heard about Jesus, and so he approached Jesus. And when desperate people will try anything, make sure you always try Jesus. Amen. The ingredients for a miracle. I'm starting from verse 5 again. Now, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him. Recognize this. Jesus enters and a centurion came to him, and then it says there, pleading with him, saying in verse 6, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed. And I want you to see this, that a centurion is now coming. My, my servant is lying at home paralyzed. I am coming, the centurion is saying, on his behalf. He's about to die. Jesus, would you help us? First ingredient you need for any miracle to happen is right there. Humility. Number one, humility. A Roman begging from an Israelite. A Roman soldier of a large empire 
is now talking to a citizen of a very small part of their empire, just a little tiny province. Look at the humility here of a Roman coming to an Israelite. Look at the humility of an officer coming to a civilian. And I want you to see the humility of a somebody, an officer of a hundred, who's now needing a nobody. So it seems. Humility will be a number one ingredient for any miracle. You want a miracle? Humility is going to have to be a major part of that. It starts out with that. In verse 7, Jesus said to him, I will come to heal him. The soldier comes to Jesus. Jesus says, I will come to heal your servant. Jesus responds to humility. In fact, the Bible says, call upon me and I will answer Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. These are scriptural promises. And so as the soldier, the officer, the Roman comes begging to Jesus, pleading. When you plead, that means you're recognized. You are lower than somebody and you recognize somebody is above you. Number one was humility. Secondly, in verse 8, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy continuation of humility that you should come under my roof but only speak the word and my servant will be healed number two ingredient after humility faith humility precedes faith before you can release your faith to believe in someone who is bigger than you you'll have to humble yourself and number two verse eight was faith what did he say He said, but only speak the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus actually said, okay, let's go. Maybe I can lay hands on your servant. Maybe I can speak to your servant. And the centurion says, Lord, you don't have to go. You just have to speak the word. He put faith in it. And then he explains why in verse 9. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. Number three, you'll need the ingredient of order, structure. God is a God of order, the Bible says. Let everything be done in decency and in order. Let me read verse 9 in its fullness. He says, for I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this. And he does it. He says, I'm a man under authority, and I have people under me. In other words, authority comes only when you are submitted to somebody higher than you, and you can now release it to somebody lower than you. This man, the centurion, understood his authority was not his own. It was coming from an officer above him. Maybe a general was above him. And as he submits to the authority of the person above him, the authority now flows through him to somebody else. If you break away from the authority of someone you are under and you're exercising authority over somebody else, that authority has been cut because he understood that I too am a man man under authority. Usually when you and I think of authority, we think that we're above somebody. He's humble enough to recognize that, no, I can only have authority over somebody when I am in authority under somebody else. He says, for I too am a man under authority. I understand how this works, Jesus. There's somebody above me I submit to, and that's why I can tell people, implying that, Jesus, you don't have to go there. You can use the authority you have submitted to the Father and release it. You can actually say to the sickness, go and the sickness will go. Jesus hears this and says, and it says there in verse 10, when Jesus heard it, he marveled. Another version, he was amazed and said, I have not found such great faith. Okay, you're going to need humility and added to that faith. And now, order. And we're talking today about the order of God. To understand that God is a God of order. Listen to this. When he says, he marveled in verse 10. I have not found such great faith. 
not even in Israel. And that's an amazing statement when he says great faith. That means faith has size. He's rebu- he also rebuked the disciples at one point, and he said, O ye of little faith, you have such little faith. And then he talks to this centurion and says, this man has such great faith. Faith has size. The question we want to ask you today is, what's the size of your faith? This man had such great faith that Jesus was amazed. I wonder if you and I can amaze Jesus by our faith and recognize this. This is a centurion who is a Roman, who is basically a pagan, whom you and I would probably call today an unbeliever. And he comes to Jesus. Faith ignores race or religion. And that's why Jesus said, I've not seen such great faith, not even in Israel. Israel, you're supposed to be the children of God. You're supposed to be the ones who have faith. I haven't seen faith like this in the nation of God's people, Jesus was saying. So faith has size. Faith faith ignores race and religion. And, And notice this. A Roman Gentile pagan who heard about Jesus now believes. An unbeliever who is a believer. An unbeliever who believes. And that's because faith is the raw material needed for miracles. If there is no faith, miracles don't happen. And that's because with faith, we mobilize the supernatural to overcome the natural. He releases his faith and says, Jesus, I believe that you can heal. I believe you don't even have to go there. I just believe that you can speak or just delegate the authority of healing. And my servant will will be healed, he said. Verse 11 and 12, after Jesus said, I've not seen faith even in all of Israel, he gives a dire warning. Verse 11, Jesus says, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In today's setting, that would mean like, hey, there will be people who come from different churches, from this church and that church, people who call themselves Christian, and yet they will not have faith to be released. And it was people that we consider as unbelievers are now putting their faith into Jesus, and the ones that will be gnashing their teeth, the weeping and gnashing of teeth will be done by the The sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the children of the kingdom. That's the church. You want to make sure that the faith of the kingdom of God, the children of God, have faith and not be outbelieved by an unbeliever. And Jesus warns that. This is what's going to happen later on in those days, the last days. Even the church will be so weak in faith that the unbelievers will have faith bigger than ours. Jesus warns them that 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 would happen. There will be gnashing of teeth. And you gnash your teeth, that means you regret because you already knew, but you, you didn't practice it. Verse 13 is amazing. He says in the last verse, Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. Go your way. So he's going believing that Jesus said, your servant's healed. In fact, in the scriptures in Luke, it says that while he was going home, the servant was being healed. The going home was an act of faith because faith without works is dead. It's not like praying right here now, Jesus, would you? Jesus didn't even say, hey, let's hold hands. Let's pray. He didn't even say that. He released his authority and says, go your way. You go. Remember what the centurion said? I have servants. I have soldiers under me. And I say, go, they go. Come, they come. I say to my servant, do this. And he does it. And Jesus releases authority and says, look, you go your way. And as he obeyed and as he went, his servant was healed. Now, put yourself in the position of the dying servant. He's lying at home probably a great fever, dreadfully tormented. He's about to die. And all of a sudden, a touch from Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit 
heals this man. All of a sudden, he's lying down in bed, and suddenly, he's just healed. He sits up. His fever is gone, and he feels perfectly well, just like that. The man doesn't even know what's going on. He doesn't even understand why did this happen. He's just lying there, and instantly, he's healed. Long distance healing. Amazing. It can happen, even right now, to somebody on the other side of the world. But I want you to see this, that the order was Jesus submitted to the Father. He released authority of healing through the, the, the centurion. And the centurion, because he connected in faith and love, faith works through love. And this, the servant was lying in bed. The centurion and the servant had not met yet. How many of you know Jesus has Bluetooth power more powerful than anything that you and I can create? How many of you know there's no distance when it comes to miracles and in faith as long as somebody believed? And so this centurion believed and it, the anointing passed through him. And as his heart was connected to his servant, the servant instantly got healed even before he got home. It wasn't like Jesus laid hands on the centurion. The centurion walked home, laid hands on, on the servant. No, it was all done through distance. Amazing. Go your way as you believed, so let it be done for you. That's what you're believing for. So he's going. He's not saying, I wonder if, if my servant is healed. I wonder if that was enough. No, he had enough faith to say, Jesus, you don't have to come to my house I'm believing that you can just release the command and my servant will be healed. Amazing story. God is a God of order is what we're talking about. We said you need humility, you need faith, and you need order. In other words, you need to be submitted to Jesus for a miracle to pass, not just to you, but through you. Amen. God is a God of order. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33 says, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. Another version would say, for God is the, not the God of disorder, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. There's an order of things for authority to be released. There's an order of things. You need humility, you need faith, and you need to have structures that are placed in the right way. Let's start out with the order of God, the order of the Trinity or the Godhead. It's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In the scriptures, it's mentioned in that same order. It's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's not Jesus, Father, Holy Spirit. It's not Holy Spirit, Father, Jesus. The scriptures will always mention it as Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Watch this, John chapter 5, verse 19. We're talking about God is a God of order. So Jesus said to them, in this passage, he's talking to the disciples. And he's saying, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father is doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. You notice this, that Jesus doesn't do things on his own accord, it says. He only does it what the Father is showing him. Notice the sequence of order. The Father shows it to Jesus. Jesus does it. Jesus even said, I have come to do the will of my Father. In other words, he's delegated. He's released by the Father, the anointing of the Father passing through to Jesus, and Jesus is doing the will of the Father. He said, even not my will, but your will be done. He prayed in Gethsemane. Notice also in John chapter 16, verse 13 and 15. However, when he, the Holy Spirit, Jesus is saying, when the Holy Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit of truth, when he comes, he will guide you into all truth. And then Jesus says, for he, the Holy Spirit, will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Jesus says, he, the Holy Spirit, will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine 
and declare it to you. All things in verse 15 that the Father has are mine, and therefore I said, He will take of what is mine and declare it to you. How? The Holy Spirit. It passes in a, in a structure of order, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now notice this. One is not greater than the other. It's a, they are a trinity. They are three persons in one, working in that sequential order. You can't say that this is greater than that and this person is greater than that. This is the Godhead. You and I can't divide that. How the Godhead or Trinity works is from the Father to the Son to the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, when G the Holy Spirit comes, he will glorify me. And Jesus says, I've come to glorify my Father. The order of the Trinity. I want you to see that God is a God of order. There's an order in the Bible of the family. You want a miracle? Put your family in order. Make sure, as the scripture would say, the husband is the head of the wife. The wife is to submit to the husband. The children are to obey their parents. Children, honor your father and mother, that your days may be long and full. It's not that the husband is greater than the wife or the wife is greater than the husband. They work as one. And God has designed it that the husband is the head of the wife and the wife is to submit to the husband. But notice this, that a husband cannot just say, hey, I am the head of the home here. Look at the scriptures. I am the head of the home. He can't say that unless that husband is also submitted to God. In other words, for the authority of the husband to be released to the wife and through him to the wife, that husband must be submitted to God. The Apostle Paul even said, look, follow me as I follow Christ. So the husband has got to submit to the, to the Lord. And that's when he, the authority of the Father, excuse me, the authority of God comes through the husband to the wife. There's a sequence. The husband cannot cut off his relationship with God and demand that he has authority over his wife. That authority only happens when the husband submits to God. The centurion said, I too am a man under authority. And so I say to my soldiers, go, and they go. He understood that he only has authority to tell his soldiers to go if he is still submitted to the officer above him. Every husband is the head of the wife. For you to be the head of the wife or your family, it would mean to say you lead in all things. You lead in spiritual things. I've seen families where the husband is bossy and tries to exercise power and authority, but the husband is not submitted to God. It's so important that a husband submits to God and the authority flows through him. A bossy husband is not a husband submitted to God. Husband is the head of the wife. The wife is to submit to the husband. And a lot of women, wives might say, I, I don't want to submit to my husband. I, I want to be the head. That's not the order of God. But I want to tell you, when your husband is submitted to God, it is so easy for a wife to submit to that husband because the authority does not start from the husband. It starts from him submitting to God. There's an order in government. Um, there's an order in the armed forces. There's an order in an office. There's structure. There's positions, etc. And what I'm encouraging you today is you, if you want a spiritual miracle or a physical mi miracle of healing, if you want miracles to happen in your life, understand you and I have a position and a role we must submit to. We must slot ourselves under authority for us to have authority over things. You and I have no authority over demonic things if we are not obedient to God ourselves. We have to submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. The submission to God gives us the authority, and the power of God flows through us in the anointing, and demons flee at the name of Jesus. And that's why it's so important when we confront, even in prayer, to rebuke the demonic, that we don't get a rebuke back from the demonic. In one particular case, the demon said, Jesus, I know, 
Paul I know, but who are you? In other words, he was questioning the authority to rebuke demons. We can rebuke demons when we are submitted to God, and then miracles happen. There's an order in the church. When you have to be submitted in a church, you can't be a lone ranger Christian who just says, you know what, Um, I don't want to submit to any church. It's just church online. You have to have people that you look up to as that is my spiritual authority. We have to be able to say, I submit to that person's counsel. I know this person. You can't just choose online, hey, I I think I like this church, I think I like this minister, and and I'm going to be a disciple. And the person doesn't even have any relationship with you at all. When you break away from the structure of God and the church, or you break away from the structure of the officer above you to the soldiers below you, when you break away, when a child says, I'm not going to submit to my parents, what's going to happen is a flow is now broken. There's an authority and a structure. You need humility. You need faith. We're talking about God is a God of order. There's an order in the church. There's an anointing that flows through that order. When we submit to order, when we position ourselves, when the wife submits to her husband, and the husband is submitted to our heavenly father, to God. He, the authority and love of the father flows from God to the husband, to the wife, and to the children, and the home is blessed with miracles in life. When things are in order, number four, authority is released. Verse 13 Then Jesus said to the centurion, go your way. As you have believed, so let it be done for you. He submits to the authority of Jesus. He's not an Israelite. He's a Roman. He's a a soldier, an officer. He submits to Jesus. And Jesus says, go your way. Who tells the person to go? The one above tells the one below to go. The soldier doesn't tell the centurion or the officer, hey, boss, go. No, it's the other way around. It's the one above who tells the one beneath, you go. And Jesus spoke that because the centurion submitted to his authority. Jesus was submitted to the authority of his father. Order is the prerequisite of authority. God is not going to release authority to a husband that is in disorder so that he can just rule ruthlessly his wife and family. The husband must be submitted to God, and when the order is correct, then God pours out authority. Even in a secular structure like your office, you entrust to your most loyal people authority. You give them keys to the room or the safe or certain access to certain areas. You give them uh, the pin code or the password. You give them authority to go to the bank for you because the person is submitted. You don't release authority to somebody who's not in submission to the structure. So now, because he had submitted himself, you want a miracle to happen? Fall in order, authority will be released. And fifthly, anointing. You've got the sequence of humility, faith, then order, authority is released, and now anointing is released. What is anointing? It's an overused Christian uh, Christian word. People say, oh, it's so anointed. What is anointing? The anointing is actually to pour out. But we're talking about the presence of God. We're talking about there is no miracle without an anointing. The anointing is the presence of God being poured out upon somebody who is now authorized to bring that anointing, and in this particular case, to touch a servant who was far away. There is no miracle without anointing, and there is no anointing without order. Order has to come first before authority is given, and then authority releases the anointing. And so the supernatural presence of God is what takes place when anointing is released. 
We talked to you last week how important it was for prayers to be answered. And a, lot of, a lot of times, people don't pray because they're not getting answers. If you and I got answers for every prayer we released, we would pray more because prayer with results will encourage more prayer. It'll strengthen our faith in prayer. And the reason why a lot of Christians don't pray is because they don't have the faith to release their prayer. But before there's even faith to be released, oftentimes we're not submitted in the right structure. And that's why God is a God of order. How important is it, City Church, to be submitted to God according to His Word? Because when we are submitted to Him and we position ourselves right, we're not the bossy wife, we're not the arrogant, stubborn, rebellious child. We're a person positioned where we should be. Once that position is placed, God recognizes the order. He releases the authority and the anointing, and prayers get answered. And it's so important for you to understand and, and me to understand in this time when a pandemic worldwide is just causing people to be anxious or to panic, to have the peace to know I am submitted to God. I'm not submitted to the world. I'm not submitted to the devil. I'm not submitted to my carnal person. I am submitted to the Lord. And where I am submitted to the Lord, authority can flow. Now, let's say you're submitted to the Lord personally, but you're not submitted to the Lord in the structures that you belong in. As human beings, we all belong to a structure. You belong to an office, there's a structure there. And when I say submit to the structure or authority, it's not just a position that you act upon, it's especially your heart. Because you can be outwardly obedient, but inwardly rebellious. You can actually have arrogance that is concealed behind the obedience. We end with Psalm 133, verse 1 to 3. A very vital and important verse to understand that God is the God of order. Verse 1 goes, Behold, or look, how good and how beautiful and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. How beautiful, and, or another version, how good and beautiful and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like precious oil. It is like the precious oil upon the head, starts from the top, running down the beard, the beard of Aaron, who is the high priest. It's like oil that is poured upon the head of Aaron down to his beard, running down, look at that, down the edge of his garments. Authority goes from higher downwards. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. In the very last sentence of this verse in 3, one, Psalm 133, verse 3, For there the Lord commands the blessing, and the blessing is life evermore. Look at that. For there the Lord commands the blessing. Where is there? Not Mount Hermon, not the mountains of Zion. Where does the Lord command the blessing? Where there's anointing, where things are in order, when things are in unity. When things are pleasant, there's a lot of disorder in the world today. Uh, a lot of things happening between Russia and Europe. A lot of things happening between Israel and Gaza. A lot of things happening be between the sea that's between the Philippines and mainland Asia. There's a lot of division happening all around the world. And it's not beautiful when it, the brethren aren't together in unity. But I want us to look at the unity first in where you are structured. Are you submitted? Am I submitted to God? Because before I can release authority anywhere else, I need to be submitted under God, and that flows through me. And it will go through whatever role I play, whether it's the head of the house, the head of an office, the head of a church, the head of a company, the head of whatever you are the head of or whatever position you are in. When you position yourself right, make sure that the persons above you are submitted to the persons above them. 
You make sure that the persons above them are ultimately, as all of us would, be submitted to God. Make sure that your cell group leader is submitted to the person above them. Make sure that uh, if you're a captain, make sure that the colonel above you is submitted to the general above him, etc., etc. There's a structure of things. The order of God is for a Christian to recognize, I am submitted to God. And whatever I, role I play, I know there are people above me, beside me, and below me. And once I position myself right, I can walk in unity. And when there's unity and order, then authority follows, anointing follows, and a miracle happens. And the servant never even got to meet Jesus. Isn't that amazing? He gets the result of a person's faith who is above him, who came to Jesus, recognizing Jesus is above me as a centurion, and Jesus has submitted to his heavenly Father. I submit to Jesus, and I release it to people who are below me. And the servant gets blessed. As you and I position ourselves, we can actually be a channel of God's blessing and anointing and miracles and power to somebody else who is under us. There are churches that are greater than City Church, and there are churches that City Church is, is greater than. And we need to not boast who is better than the other, but we need to recognize and position and say we need to bless the ones above us and bless the ones below us. And as a church, we've always said we are a church, we are a church that wants to bless other churches. And you and I are a Christian that wants to bless other Christians. And some are greater than us, and some are lesser than us. Reality of life. But to whom much is given, much is required. Why am I talking about this today? It's for you and I to not waste our prayers, because these are crucial times. These are times where it is so important for a Christian and a church and a family to be positioned properly so that his anointing flows through us when we are structured right, so that authority is given to us, so that when we release it in prayer, when we release it in teaching, we want to make sure that when we release things, it comes from an authority above us and ultimately it comes from God. We cannot bypass the structure we are in and saying, well, I'm speaking in the name of Jesus Christ, but I'm rebe in rebellion to the church. I'm rebellious to my office. I'm rebellious to my parents, but I'm praying in Jesus' name. Now, you, you and I still have to follow not just the structures of the heavenlies, but the structure that we are placed here on earth. And that's why Jesus said to the person questioning him about the Roman coin, Jesus says, you render unto Caesar what is due to Caesar, and you render unto God what is due to God. There's too many Christians running around, not submitted to the proper structure, gossiping, backbiting, talking about other churches, or even about their own church. There's too many companies talking against another companies, too many countries talking against other countries. And this is where it's so important that we understand that we fall in the position that we were ordered to be in. And let the promotion be left to God. We understand this. If we are faithful in serving the people below us, God will increase us by promoting us. Promotion is not about money or position. Promotion is God is saying, I see you faithful in little, blessing others beneath you. Let me put you up so there will be more people that you can bless because God is not interested about a salary increase or a position or title that you and I hold. He is interested in the people that we touch. Promotion means we can now be positioned by God to touch more people. And those that are faithful in little, God will be releasing more blessing to be faithful to much. We pray today that you learn and you're blessed by this. Father, we position ourselves. Whatever structure we are in, whether it's family or office, whether it's government, whatever structure we are in positionally here on earth, we position ourselves in the proper place. And ultimately, we position ourselves to be right with you. We submit every area of our lives we pray that every person listening would be captivated by this truth that is released. And the knowledge of this truth can set us free. And our prayers will not be wasted. And the beautiful thing about this, Lord, is somebody not listening to this 
can be touched by the person who is listening with an open heart. A miracle can happen to a third party, long distance healing. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week in June.
until you created the light of the world, abandoned in darkness to time. And as you speak, a hundred billion barriers disappear. Where you lost your life so I could find it here. You left the grave behind you so alive. I can see your heart. You're the one who never leaves the 